Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Today I'm going to talk about W. B. Yeats's uh, poem Lida and the Swan. Lida and the Swan is a short form uh, poem written in the form of a sonnet. Uh, but of course, the structure of a sonnet is not a conventional structure. So we know that a sonnet is made out of a 14 line stanza um, divided sometimes into some quatrains, three quatrains in a couplet if it is in English form, and also an octave and a sestet if it is the Petrarchan or Italian form. Uh, but this one, um, though it seems to be Petrarchan sonnet, but we see a break in the structure of the poem. And this is natural. In the 20th century, there were some changes made to the whole form of a sonnet, the patterns the sonnet would follow uh, would have changed in the 20th century. So let us see the story of Lida and the Swan, why the poem is written. Uh, but beforehand, uh, let me just introduce uh, some historical background, some mythological background, let's say. So uh, what was the myth of, the, uh, of Lida and the Swan? Uh, there are different versions for the myth, but my intention here is to introduce what was intended by Yeats. So I know that there are some variations in the whole story, but just let us stick to what was in the mind of the poet when he wrote it. So the first question to ask is who was Lida? Lida was an Italian princess who became a Spartan queen and actually she married King Tyndarius of Sparta. And well, this picture well shows uh, Lida and the swan together and you see how the features of the face of the swan is somehow represented and the features of the face of Lida. Uh, let us move on. And who was the swan, therefore, who had affected Lida to that extent? Is Zeus. Uh, well, Zeus was never satisfied with his relationship with women, whether in form of the god the goddesses like Hera, who was his wife, or nymphs, or even human beings, or you no know, females, were always uh, grabbing his attention in his eye. And that's why Hera was always checking on him. She, she was very careful what she does. So when Zeus wanted to have, a, have an intercourse and affair to make love with a woman on earth, he had to change shape. And this time uh, he turned into a swan and then came, he came from the heavens into earth and then he found Leda and the story starts. And this uh, this uh, very story had inspired many painters and artists throughout history, like this one, as you can see. Uh, they say that, based on the legend, Lida, at the same night, had an affair with her own husband as well. So, uh, you know, she got pregnant with four children. Two of them were Zeus's children, but two of them belonged to Tyndarius. Uh, the, the ones uh, who were Zeus' uh, children were immortals. They, uh, they had actually a color, a tinge of their father. The first one was Helen, whose story is the most important one here, and her brother, Alex. And there were also two mortal children, uh, the children of King Kinderius, Clytemnestra, and Castor. They say that Pollux and Castor, though one of them immortal, the other mortal, were born in form of a twin. And if even if you check the pictures, the statues made of the two, they're always together. And they, in, uh, under the you know picture or the statue, it is written Castor or Pollux. So we don't know exactly who is Castor, who is Pollux. And about Helen and Clytemnestra, Clytemnestra is mortal, but uh, some critics believe that she was affected by the power of the swan. So this is also uh, worthy of mentioning because we see later on how Clytemnestra is kind of referred to in, w in W.B. Yeats's poem, Lady and the Swan. And I like this painting because it shows everything about the story. Uh, we have the swan, we have the man, uh, we have both the feathers of the bird and also the hands of the man. And in some versions of the story, they said that instead of getting pregnant, uh, because it was an intercourse with this one, Helen hatched an egg and the children were just incubated. 
And um, the details are great in this painting because we see two of the children have feathers, Sloan's children, and two of them are normal or King Tyndarius. Uh, later on, when these children just got elder, things happened. Uh, first of all, I should just remind you that Zeus uh, didn't feel responsible for his offsprings. What was important for him was the intercourse, the affair itself to make love with that woman. When that wish was fulfilled, he had nothing to do with the whole story. So um, King Tyndarius was also the father of Helen Pollux Castor and Clytemnestra, all of them. Uh, Helen married King Menelaus, who was a king of Sparta, and Clytemnestra married uh, Menelaus' brother, Agamemnon, who was a king of Mycenae. Uh, well, and this painting shows Helen and King Menelaus. So what was Helen's story? And uh, once again, how uh, how she's related to Leda and the Swan. By the way, in this picture, you see Elizabeth Taylor uh, playing the role of Helen of Troy in, in an adaptation, in a movie adaptation of Christopher Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, if you're interested, you can just uh, just watch it. And it is interesting that in that movie as well, they, they consider Helen not as a normal human being. She, her hair is not natural. There are some shining aspects, some sparkling things over her. So she was, you know, she has, let's say, something of that goddess in herself, something, something that immortality, which distinguishes her from the other women living on Earth. So what was Helen's story and how is she related to Troy? You know, Helen was married, but, you know, the story of Troy started long before even, you know, uh, the story of uh, Troy or the story of Helen and, and many, many other things. It's, it, it is just the affairs of the gods and the goddesses. And once again, we see how the gods or goddesses are influencing the history of mankind, how they are changing the course of history, how how they just make changes, they do things, and they intervene in the affairs of mankind. So it goes back to the story of Eris uh, and her golden apple. Eris was the daughter, based on some, some of the versions of the story, she was the daughter of Hera and Zeus, and she was the goddess of chaos, strife, and discord. And well, Ares played an important role in the events that eventually led to the Trojan War. All of the Olympians had been invited to the wedding, Peleus and Thetis, who would become the parents of Achilles. Also, there are other versions for this story. However, Ares was not invited due to the inclination to cause discourse. So they thought that if they invite her into the wedding, um, she would make a chaos, a strife, or um, a kind of squimish among gods, so they preferred not to inv invite her, and she was very angry for that. So she took revenge. As a means of revenge, Eris dropped the golden apple of discord into the party, which had the words to the fairest one inscribed in it. Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, three goddesses, started um, a quarrel over the golden apple, who can have the golden apple? Everyone believed, every one of these three goddesses believed that they are the most beautiful. Uh, started quarreling over who the apple should be given to. So Zeus appointed Paris, Prince of Troy, as a person to solve the dispute. Actually, this time, Zeus was not so kind or he was not in, in search of justice to uh, take place. Rather, um, he actually preferred not to intervene because if he chose Hera, uh, who was his wife, he would lose the favors of Athena and Aphrodite, and he didn't like that. And if he chose either of these two women, Athena and Aphrodite, Hera would be extremely jealous, and his life would be another chaos. So then it was not merely for the sake of justice, but to just you know, uh, not having a role, not playing out a role in the whole story. He, he was he just stood stood away from the course of the incidents and he let Paris decide. And Paris uh, was, uh, was the son of the king and queen of Troy, uh, King Kikuba, uh, sorry, King uh, Miriam and uh, uh, sorry, King Priam and Queen Hecuba. And 
well, uh, in that old story that uh, I was born with a bad almond, so uh, I was recommended that um, have it, um, you know, be killed. But the one who was responsible for that took pity on the baby, and a shepherd found the baby. And well, Paris uh, was living as a shepherd at the time when he was asked uh, to judge among these goddesses. So a vision of the golden apple. And you see apples play a crucial role in human history, whether we approach it from the Christian theology point of view or from the mythological point of view. Here in this uh, picture, you see the three goddesses in Paris, golden apple in his hand. This is naturally Aphrodite uh, with Cupid. And maybe it's not a good place to bring children with, but by the way, should it so? And you see how Aphrodite stands uh, away from the other two goddesses and she has the right because Aphrodite was the essence of beauty she was beauty itself so <laughs> her beauty was natural to her her beauty was essential to her part of her being while this was not the case uh, about these two goddesses and you see how her hair has some waves because Aphrodite was taken from the waves and you know the, the, her name even means that she's venus in, in the roman mythology but in the greek uh, greek version she's called aphrodite it means someone taken out of froth of the sea so uh, this is aphrodite this is athena the war uh, and the, sorry the goddess of war and wisdom and this is hera she is famous for her power and now uh, paris is supposed to judge among these three uh, well, before giving the apple, uh, Paris asked these three goddesses to wash their bodies in a spring so they are purified and therefore he can see them naked so that he can have a better judgment. <laughs> okay, these things seem to be a little bit funny, but <laughs> Paris, uh, Paris was chosen for his fairness. And he, he took everything so seriously. So you see different paintings inspired by this mythological incident. And let us move on. And the three goddesses tried to make promises to Paris, uh, or, or not to use the euphemism uh, to, to make promises. We can say that they started to bribe Paris. How? Um, here are promised him the kingdom of Europe and Asia if he chose her, and uh, Athena, wisdom and war skills. Uh, but, but it was Aphrodite's suggestions which uh, grabbed his attention, the most beautiful woman in the world. And it, it was known that the most beautiful woman on earth is Helen. And quiet, unintentionally, and I'm, and I'm quiet ironical, <laughs> it was intentional, uh, Aphrodite forgot to mention that Helen is already married. So, uh, you know, the, the whole story started from there. Helen was abducted by Paris and some versions of the story say that she was not reluctant to do so. It was an adventure or she had kind of, you know, as you can see, even in this picture, she suggested she loved Paris and uh, they escaped to Troy, and then Troy was besieged by King Menelaus, his brother Agamemnon, and other kings and powerful men uh, from Sparta, because when Helen uh, was getting married to Menelaus, her father made a pact among, his, among her other suitors that if one day her husband needed help, all of those guys who were formerly Helen's suitors have to support and sponsor Helen's husband. So uh, the siege of Troy started and then the story of the Trojan horse and Treva was on fire. And these two paint paintings also show Helen in Paris. And I like this one because it is uh, painted by a woman. And, and most of the times we have 
uh, the, the uh, masculine vision of Helen, uh, she's imagined uh, by, by male painters, but we have a female uh, painter here, artist there, who had uh, pictured and portrait Helen. And this is Antonio Brodsky's Paris in a Phrygian hat, you know, Paris before the time he gets back to Troy with Helen. And um, but you see, it's, he's somehow effeminized here. And this painting, or, or at least I see the kind of corpulence or feminization of his face and his body, maybe I'm wrong. Uh, by the way, let's turn to the text of the poem. And this is one of the old paintings found on an air or something. Uh, it's very old, it's antique. Uh, let's turn to the text of the poem. Now we know the story, but let me ask something. For WBAs, uh, this story is not just as mythologically beautiful or something um, as others may have thought about it. This is the story of rape, and he shows the divinities, the gods' intervention into the affairs of man in form of rape, and form of and form of a um, uh, kind of violent sex. So this is the story, how uh, how William Butler Yeats sees this, a sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl. She's staggering, Lida, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, just check the words, they are negative, he uses negative adjectives or terms uh, to describe uh, Zeus. Her nape caught in his bill, he holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified, vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? You see, vague fingers, she's paralyzed. She cannot move. She's just passively receiving that feathered glory. Glory because he's Zeus, the god of gods, and feathered. Because now Zeus is in form of a, a form of a bird, and how can body lead in that white rush? You see, once again, a white rush is not, it is not just intended by Lida. Um, so, so she's not into it. It's a white rush. She's rushed over by a bird, but feel the strange heart beating where it lies. So she cannot just stand against him, and she gives in. A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken bowl, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. And Yeats in this two and a half line, uh, and lines repeat, uh, just reports the whole story, shudder in the loins, it happens, the rape happens, engenders there the broken bowl, the broken bowl of Troy, and then the Trojan horse just entered the city and the city was ruined. And also it can be a minor reference to uh, Lida's, uh, you know, virginity. It's not, it's not, of course, virginity in the sense, uh, but because, uh, you know, the virginity of mankind not being raped by, by a god till that moment, the broken wall, the hymen, may be the reference here, alongside Troy, the burning roof and tower of Troy and Agamemnon death. So the story continues after, the victory of the Spartans um, in Troy, they came back and Agamemnon takes uh, a woman, Cassandra, with him uh, to home. And uh, her, his wife, Clytemnestra, Helen's sister, was already angry with him because he had killed dear daughter Iphigenia, she, you know, throughout the war because she, she actually played the role of a scapegoat. She was uh, just sacrificed for the gods for the victory in the war, though Agamemnon could somehow avoid it, but he didn't do, uh, he didn't do so. So um, Clytemnestra was already angry with him. And then he just take a woman into home and while well, she was mad at him. And therefore she killed Agamemnon. That's why Agamemnon is dead. And later on, it, it, the story continues, but not in this poem. Uh, Orestes and Electra decided to kill their mother to revenge their father. And uh, another matricide also happened. So um, and the point here in this poem is uh, that this line, this is the third line of the Sestet, this is a Petrarchan Senate, is just broken here. You know, half of it is not here. Where is, where is, you know, actually the other half? 
in the next part of the poem. So we see that the poem is actually more than if you if we just uh, you know enumerate if we, if we just count, count the numbers of the lines, we see that it's not fourteen; it is fifteen. But the case is that you know uh, these two lines actually make up one line, or as if something is just omitted here, erased. From, from the history, we don't know, but he, he means it. The, the broken sonnet also reflects, uh, reflects the fragmentary world in which W.B. Yeats was living. And uh, the, the, the whole poem can be a reference to the world war, for example. And also, uh, it, uh, it can also be a reflection of the edifice of the Troy or, or the, the, the palace in Troy, uh, which was shattered, being so caught up so mastered by the brute blood, brute blood of the air, brute blood of Zeus, the god, that, that she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent bee could let her drop. And uh, technically speaking, we call such questions rhetorical questions. We mean that we know uh, the answer already. And uh, the, the answer is no. If she knew, if Helen, knew if she, if, if she could just have the knowledge of her father, nothing like that would happen. If mankind was as wise as a goddess, nothing as bad as Troy and nothing as bad as a world war would happen. Uh, so um, W.B. Ace, when he was asked about this issue, not necessarily about this poem, the, 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 the question was that Mr. W.B. Ace, can we know the truth? He answered, um, we can embody the truth, but we cannot know it. So uh, Lida also embodied the truth, that which was, you know, the, what, what the God put in her, but she could not know it. Uh, neither her children did. And this was my discussion and introduction to WBH's Lida and the Swan. I hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, my uh, my PowerPoint template is downloaded from SlideSchool. Thank you very, very much for listening. And I will see you later.